kind of nuts, you know, like I did podcasting for 10 years here at This Week in Startups, my passion, and it's gone incredible. And uh, then you just do this like little tiny side project and it gets to like, it broke into the top 10 episodes of the week over the last couple of weeks. It's really bizarre. That's become so popular. It's crossed over into like colleges and, you know, civilians and stuff like that. I think it's a really cool thing if like you've got like people... Like I always tell our players or our coach, like you want to understand tech, just listen every week. <laughs> this Week in Startups is brought to you by Finn can't burn its mouth on hot pizza or wave at someone who wasn't waving at them. Finn can resolve half of your customer support tickets instantly before they reach your team. Meet Finn, a breakthrough AI bot by Intercom, ready to join your support team today. Visit intercom.com slash Finn lemon.io need to speed up your product development without draining your budget hire vetted engineers from europe at lemon.io go to lemon.io slash twist to get 15 percent off for the first four weeks and superside design and creative are crucial for growth tech companies like shopify amazon and meta have found the perfect solution superside Get $2,000 off with Superside's Startup Accelerator Package at superside.com slash twist. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. I am super excited because friend of the pod who hasn't been on since pre-COVID, Ryan Smith, the co-founder of Qualtrics. And now, he's not just a fan of the Utah Jazz. He bought the team. He enjoyed it so much that he bought the team. Welcome back to the program, Ryan Smith. Hey, it's good to be back on. I'm glad you're still doing this, man. I remember uh, 2019. Yeah, right before, before the, the pandemic. World, before San Francisco and the world got crazy. It was, uh, Is it, it's so weird. The last, I mean, how do you look back on the last four years? So much has happened also for you, uh, buying the team, et cetera. But it is crazy how business has changed. And you also, you had done the IPO at that time, I guess, or shortly thereafter, maybe. Yeah, we had just sold and we're still kind of rocking and then decided the ipo was a year later and then it's been it's been crazy Quite for the last four years it's been a little a lot nuts, of man a lot of transactions uh i gotta just start with the team uh what a dream to buy the team uh how's it been this is you're going into your second year i think yeah we're starting our actually our beginning of our third season we kind of took over a half year um you know it's it'd be like you with the knicks yeah. like it's <laughs> it's your team i think when adam yeah. Adam called me when we kind of did the announcement and said, hey, Ryan, like, if you're lucky, you can be part of the NBA. If you're really lucky, you can work in it or be in a small ownership piece of it. Yeah. And if you've won the lottery, you get to be like a majority owner. Yeah. And, but no one gets their team. Yeah. And you have the team you grew up watching, sneaking into the arena as a kid, like. Yeah. And so, it's not lost on me. I mean, it's a huge responsibility, especially with the team who has never won it. We're the second winningest franchise over the last 30 years, which is crazy. Mm. And most people know us for being such a prominent figure in the last dance, but not getting over like we peaked during those Jordan years. And so... Oof, don't I know it. <laughs> Nick's as well. Yeah. <laughs> the Ewing era. So, There's yeah. a whole so list of teams and players who like, they just, they played during the Jordan years and it's just, yeah, he's the GOAT. So, yeah, so we've just got a, uh, we got a lot of opportunity and we're excited. I mean, Utah's grown a lot and it's a huge responsibility, but it's fun. Super fun. And what, what's your approach been? I, you know, I listen to like Bill Simmons and a bunch of folks, they talk about new owner syndrome and new owners coming in and getting frisky and, you know, jumping the fence, doing crazy stuff. What's your, I mean, you must be aware of all that and you must think about it like a business. Cause I know you're a big strategist and you think about it like a chessboard or a business, I'm sure. It just involves people, it involves a strategy, it involves a budget, all of those things. So what's your approach been? And how do you think about the league and building that winning culture and then ultimately getting the chip, which is obviously the goal, you want to get the chip for your team? Yeah, so so one of the things Adam said to me when I came in was like, don't take whatever you've learned through Qualtrics and your time in tech and check it at the door. That would be the biggest mistake. We actually want you to bring that here. And um but it's totally different, right? Mm. Um, in, in tech, we measure ourselves through market share. 
And if we have a certain amount of market share, we feel good. And there can be multiple winners. And actually, even second place in search is not that bad. No. Um, <laughs> and uh, if, you, if you look at it um, within then our world, like we're actually in a closed marketplace in the NBA, mm-hmm. which means whoever you deal with, you're going to have to deal with again. There's not new entrants. Yeah. They're all there. So you've got to behave in a way that, you know, you need to go back to the well or back to another team or back to another player. And that really, really matters. Um, You know, in tech, we can just go out and recruit whoever we want at any time and create roles and do this. Like that's not the way it works. Mm. Um, And then I think some of the things that I've learned, like we're all super competitive and we're also super impatient in tech. And that's really, really hard because tomorrow comes. And you have a finite amount of assets you have to play with. And everyone kind of has the same amount of assets up to a point. Mm. Um, And you've got to strategically go through and place these bets and know when to place the bets. And you've got to get lucky. And Mm. so if you look at what I came into, I came in in my first year, we were the winningest team in the league in the regular season. But we got bounced from the playoffs pretty early. Mm. Um, Second year, we ran it back, didn't really want to mess it up. Like the team was kind of in the latter half of a pretty good run. Um, We had two all-stars and Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Gobert. And I really hadn't done anything. I just kind of watched. Mm. And um, I got a chance to work with, um, or at least the possibility to work with, kind of the person who I idolized in basketball was Danny Ainge, who had run Mm. the Boston Celtics for 18 years. And It's a killer. um, My my tech background was like, Ryan, surround yourself with the best people you can get. And it felt mm. like I was going out to recruit an executive like we all have done. Yep. And said, hey, how do we get Danny to come in and like help run the team? And then who do we put around? And we had Justin Zanuck and ended up going through a coaching change. And how'd you get Danny Ainge? Yeah. Because he was, that's a hard one. I mean, it's yeah. it's not just about money for him. It's got to be about opportunity, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think he was in a in a spot where it was a career shift. His kids lived out here in Utah. Um, we have been friends for a really long time, and um, you know, I think that you know, creating a role that worked for him at this time of his life, right? Mm. And you know, a lot of times as CEO, you probably need someone around to make six or seven hard decisions. And that's kind of what I need Danny for, right? Yeah. We can keep the trains running on time, but there's the draft that comes up and decision to really when to go all in and how to go all in and have someone who's been through every side of it. Um, you know, you've got someone who's been in the league for 46 years as a player at a championship level, as a coach, as a GM, um, and now as CEO. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. And then how do you build an organization around that so it all works? Mm. And so, you know, we made the decision to kind of take a step backwards, which really isn't popular. And it's definitely unnatural of what the type of splash I would draw up if I was coming in as a new owner. Yeah. Is to say, hey, we're going to trade two All-Stars yep. the year before we actually host the All-Star game in Salt Lake City. Right. Which our <laughs> fans are looking forward to. Like, you yeah. couldn't draw probably a worse strategy. But... We end up getting Lowry marketing back in the trade. He ends up starting the all-star game. Um, Mm. We end up kind of getting the Minnesota's draft pick with Walker Kessler, who's now on Team USA in year two. Um, It looked like we have, um, you know, we kind of accelerate a little bit on that process. And um, we have a lot of draft capital going forward, which provides hope and a lot of assets. Like you guys broke the nba with that go bear trade it was like wh- how did danny ainge do that he got four first round picks and like now everybody else who tries to trade for somebody's like well wait we got four for rudy Gobert, great player w- what does kevin durant get what is you know the next person mm-hmm. get i mean that when he came to you with that deal you must have been like what how did that how's that possible i mean there's no like i always hate moving on from guys yeah. Right. Like, like I like this idea and it's just similar to tech. Like I like working with people for a really long time and kind of, yeah. I think there's stability and continuity matters a lot. And I think it matters in basketball as well. So there was no deal or idea that made me excited. Right. Mm. However, um, if we're going to go down that direction, then, you know, 
it, and it makes sense. I understand why other teams are doing it. You just saw this with Phoenix. Like Phoenix yeah. went all in because they think it's a chance to push them over to give them that ability to go win a championship. And, you know, when one championship and an organization that hasn't won it, like that's worth whatever. That's worth maybe even, you know, yeah. taking the next five years and struggling. It is, it does seem like if you do have a window to go for it, the, the, you should take a swing, right? Cause the, uh, there's no dominance anymore with LeBron at the, you know, end of his career, the Warriors, you know, still dominant, but, you know, certainly beatable, uh, as we've seen. Uh, you know, it's, it feels like anybody is so wide open right now that everybody's got a shot. I mean, even my Knicks made it to the second round and, you know, we're, yeah. we've, we're kind of in a similar situation to you with a lot of young, great draft picks and a ton of, uh, a, a lot of young talent, a lot of picks, and a lot of reasonable salaries. It does seem like that's the other key is the flexibility you have, right, to wait around for, because so many stars move now. It's not like when we were kids where Ewing or Hakeem Olajuwon or whoever is going to stay for 10 years, you know, or 12 years or whatever it is. It's, it seems like the players move around and everybody's kind of accepted that, right? As like... Yeah, I just think, I, yeah, the Stockton and Malone days where people are staying in one spot or the Steph Curry. I mean, Steph is such an anomaly, right? And, so or Jokic. Like yeah. it's getting someone who's going to spend possibly their entire career in one spot. Ideally, you could do that, but it's super, super difficult, um, especially with the new CBA that just came out that was just signed. I think that's going to increase the player movement. I mean, we had 50 something players move at the trade deadline last year. And so. As you go through that, but there's a lot of teams. I think the teams over the next five years are going to be different than the ones that you see now. I mean, you could see Oklahoma City. You could see mm. some of these other teams, you know, with Detroit or Houston or ourselves, like really rise up as some of those who have had a good run, like the Warriors or others. I mean, um, it's hard to maintain a 20-year run. Mm. Finn can't go through a goth phase or still be haunted by a bad haircut they had in middle school. Finn can resolve half your customer support tickets instantly before they reach your team. What is Finn? Finn is a breakthrough AI bot from Intercom designed for customer support teams. It learns your entire knowledge database and has the ability to carry conversations, remember context and nuance while slashing your resolution times and support volume. Meet Finn, a breakthrough AI bot by Intercom, ready to join your support team at A. Visit intercom.com slash Finn. We'll get back to Qualtrics in a minute, but it's fascinating because buying a team, uh, it's hard to do. So what's that process like to even, because I don't think people understand the structure of the NBA. It's a, it's a, the owners own the league. And so you have 30 owners and they're all like a partnership. It's kind of like an LLC mm -hmm. or something like a, like almost like a law firm or a venture partnership. Is that, is that kind of more analogous to the structure than a, and a C corporation? Yeah, I mean, essentially, you know, there's always this debate. Do you own 3% of the NBA or do you own 100% of the Utah Jazz, right? Right. And um, I think that as we look out, at the end of the day, we are partners. Mm. And, you know, you're, you're making decisions together. You want to kill each other on the court. But, but, you know, you come together in your meetings and you're saying, hey, how do we benefit the league through a new television deal or a new CBA? And how do you actually come together and work together? And you actually get pretty close and you become friendly. Yeah. And, but at the same time, once again, it's a closed yeah. market. You have to face them in the playoffs or you have to face them when you're doing deals. And, um, you know, you got to work with these people for a long time. And so it's a unique process. Uh, I, I remember going through it and it was actually, it started about the same time we decided to take Qualtrics public in 2020 mm. and, or 2019, the summer of 19. And, Reality was, you know, it closed, the team closed right around the same time as we went public. They were all within like a week or two of each other. And I was wow. like, this has to be the craziest dual. I've been, I've been a part of a couple dual tracks. This was the craziest dual track because the, the thoroughness mm. of that process was, I, I would argue it was way more intense than going public. Really? Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Well, and when you think about it, like, did you see the Blackberry movie by chance yet? The new? No, Indiv no, I didn't see it, but we were just talking about that. Yeah. I'm, I'm going, I have it downloaded on my iPad, actually. Oh, it is so good. It, I mean, it's a $4.5 million independent film, but 
yeah. just for tech guys and for guys who yeah. like sports. You know, the guy who came in to be, you know, the hired gun, sharky, sharp elbowed CEO of BlackBerry. Um, he tries to buy an NHL team and he, you know, basically just doesn't, he, he, he does, it's pretty well known. He doesn't, um, pass the sort of, you know, the, the sniff test with the, with the other yeah. owners. And so you, you basically have to, the other owners vote on you essentially. They, they have to want to be partners with you. Uh, and then I guess that's nerve wracking, right? No, for sure. And they have to know you and like what they're getting and how they're getting it. And, um, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a process, especially myself, like coming into a team or a family that had owned the team for 30 something years. Mm. They basically brought it. We're part of bringing it to Utah. I mean, it's, it's royalty here. And so how do you, how do you come in and like not screw it up or keep it going and like, but also put your own, flavor mm -hmm. on it and so i think yeah. when we ke we came into the league everyone asked me well what type of owner or what type of executive are you going to be in the nba and it's like well i've been a leader for a long time and i've run a company i don't have another persona it's yeah. like i'm kind of myself like that's yeah. how it's going to be i'm ryan and that's who i am and um you know because they want to they want to classify you they want to say are you going to be like mark cuban are you going to be steve Ballmer? are you going to be over here or like how involved are you going to be? And it's like, well, I'm, I'm involved in pretty much anything I'm doing. It's the only way to, to actually, yeah. I, I haven't seen success otherwise. And, um, but I also don't think I have to run or make every decision and I can provide room where people like Danny or others and really talented people want to work around you. And so yeah. it's, uh, it's an interesting dynamic. Yeah. I, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm so crushed that we, you didn't trade. Spider to I New know. York. I, I know. So, I know. I mean, I you knew this was going to come up. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> we're so, New Yorkers yeah. right now, we, we really do not like Danny Age. <laughs> if he was he's working a, for us, we'd love him. But He's oh, an unbelievable God. kid. That is, that is one special kid. <sighs> I mean, I mean, we beat him. Yeah, we beat Cleveland in the playoffs. We trounced him. And it, you just saw the look on Spider's face. He's like, why can't I be a Nick? He just wants to be a Nick. <laughs> hey, I didn't, I didn't say that. <laughs> I know he, he said it he, all summer long. He's in New York. He's coming. Yeah, I he's this is my there. theory. He's going to do it one more year, and then he's going to come. I have I, I have faith. I'm really interested where Dame hey, goes. You got to give it up for Cleveland. They went all in. They went all they in. Did. I mean, they traded yeah. us a starting all star. Like he, I mean, that's yeah. pretty crazy. It's pretty crazy. Uh, and yeah. What a, what a season last year, huh? Wow, it was just incredible to see Miami go from the eighth seed and wind up in the finals wild it's the play-in tournament's working i love the play-in tournament you, you like it too right yeah i think i think one of the things i like about the nba that i think maybe some other leagues haven't we're, we're disrupting ourselves like we just approved a in-season tournament yeah Tell me about that. What? What? Is, well, how is well, this exactly going to work? I know it's part of like you know. I don't think I don't think anyone really it. knew. Yeah, I don't think anyone really knew how the the playing tournament would go. Mm -hmm. But I think there's enough evidence that we're willing to try new stuff. And I think that that in, as we've all learned in tech, like that is like the first like realization that we've got a bright future is if we're willing to invent. Yeah. And and I look around at other leagues and. You know, the one that's top of mind for me is like live in golf. Like, why did it have to get to this point? Right? right. Like, you should have disrupted yourself. And we always have a saying at Qualtrics, we need to be our own activists. Mm -hmm. If there was an activist inside our company, what would they do? Oh, I like right. that. Well, we should go do it. What would they tell us to go do about our own company? Right. Yeah. And run that exercise. And I think, I think the MBA, um, I like. I like the thought process here, whether it's right or wrong, whether it works or it doesn't work. Um, I feel like we, we sit around and we get forward thinking around tech, around camera angles, around television, around streaming. We're, yep. we're leaning in hard on these things. And with global expansion, NBA Africa, you know, a lot of these bets aren't clear. And like we we use the brand well and we work together to go do it and i think it's an exciting league to be a part of for that reason yeah i i, I love anything that makes the regular season more important to me is great uh and now you're starting to see like teams are not towards the end of the season tanking saying yeah you know we'll just 
we we don't or we don't or we don't have to sit you know our top players and then getting rid of those back to back to back games you know and i actually think maybe even the number of games per season 82 games feels like maybe yeah, 72 74 keep the players a little healthier or tighter maybe that would be good i don't know um but, but, I'm but you even saw with it with the draft yeah. you even saw yeah. with the draft we had an incredible draft this year where there was a lot of hype around victor and scoot and everyone yep. and you know everyone the last four had the same chance and so i i went and sat in the ping pong room because i wanted to experience it once and like i had my numbers it was like playing keno right <laughs> where or like you're sitting there and the numbers come up and i was like whoa this is fascinating like yeah. one one number comes up from a ping pong ball and it changes the future of your entire franchise or it could, right? And, yeah. You know, I think it's done that for San Antonio, right? Um, <laughs> we'll see. But, like, the, yeah. it's real. It's really interesting, these tall guys. Uh, we had Porzingis for a bit and then he couldn't stay on the court and then just had his, I think what it was probably his best season last year on, sure. the, uh, on the Wizards. Sure. Uh, and it, we were, there was a whole contingent in New York like, should we bring him back? Should we try to get him to come back? He's, uh, that was crushing for me when we traded from. Hey, let's go to uh, and then this. Oh, before we go to Qualtrics, this midseason tournament. What's 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 that going to be like? What do you what impact do you think well, that's so, going to have? Yeah, so I think I think it's exactly this where the games count as regular season games, but there's incentive, there's motivation, there's a lot of television around it. It culminates in Vegas, and I think um, it's I think it's a little bit of a uh, you know I, I think we're going to look at it from a team standpoint to say, hey, where do we stack up? Where are we at? How are we really feeling? Because then mm. that's followed by the trade deadline. Because ah. a lot of times you don't know. Mm. You don't know um, until really like the second half. Like, where are you really at? And, you know, there's injuries and people haven't played together. And um, I think it'll be a good test in the middle of the season, which will make the regular season really um, pop. And then people will want to get, you know, in a rhythm before that coming into that hot. Um, so nice. I don't think anyone knows the unintended or the intended consequences of it all. I think just like the play in tournament, I don't think people had ever seen the Miami heat, for example, get all the yeah. way through to the finals. Yeah. I love it. It just, it creates so much drama the week before the playoffs start you, you, those ninth and 10th teams, right? You just, now they're got a shot and, and you know, getting into a, a playoff berth, that's what the fans want. They want to come to some playoff games. I mean, I flew to New York to go to the playoff games. Like, I literally, I, I'm like, I'm 52 now. There's a certain amount of Knicks playoff games left, and I'm going to see them, you know? I'm going to be there yeah. in person unless Elon takes, you know, I, I had to miss the Cleveland starts because Elon decided to, you know, have the Starship rocket go up, and I was like, oh, Starship rocket, Cleveland. You got you to gotta come out to Utah. The I'm experience, oh, the experience the is unique. Like it is, we're we're really drawn it up. It's the world I come from, and um, basketball. It's, it's a, a basketball city. Yeah, I mean, and it's amazing who comes into Utah. Huh. Like everyone comes through Utah. Yeah. Like go talk to anyone. Say, hey, when was the last time you were in Utah? It's like, oh, I just went to Zion, or I'm up in Park City. they like, and now we're we're bringing it all together. Yeah, and every night people are there and saying, hey. Like, whoa, I didn't, I've always come up here. I come up here to ski. I come up here to hang out. Just yeah. didn't know that this was here. Yeah, it's great. Okay, listen, you got an idea for a tech startup. Great. You think you want to change the world. You think you, you got this. This is the one. Well, you've got that same problem that we all do. You don't have an engineer or you don't have enough engineers to make this happen. And you need product velocity. You need to go fast. And how are you going to go fast? And how are you going to control your burn rate if you got no engineers? Well, what if you had a partner who could provide you with more than a thousand on-demand developers? And those developers were all vetted, experienced, result-oriented, and passionate about startups and building great products. Well, what if they also charge competitive rates? Does this all sound too good to be true? I know it does. Well, then you need to head to Lemon.io because your dreams have come true right now. Startups, choose Lemon.io because they only offer hand-picked developers with three or more years of experience and ones that have strong portfolios. Only 1% of candidates who apply to work at Lemon.io actually get accepted. And if anything goes wrong, Lemon will get you a replacement ASAP. A couple of great launch founders have worked with Lemon.io, uh, people in our portfolio, and they have had great experiences. So I want you to learn more at Lemon.io slash twist. And when you go there, you're going to find your perfect developer or any entire tech team. And you're going to do that in 48 hours or less. And twist listeners get 15% off the first four weeks. I want you to stop burning money. I want you to hire developers smarter and faster. Visit lemon.io slash twist and give it a shot. 
getting people to see the local games. This is like one of my big hardships. I'm traveling around the world. I pay for the top level NBA league pass where they take out the commercials and give you like the in arena stuff because I'm such an NBA lunatic. I like to watch the inside MSG and, you know, see like the local coverage. Uh, But then I get all these blackout dates and, you know, like sometimes I'm trying to like get my VPN right (laughs) so I can just watch my team. It's like, you know, every... 15th game there's something going on where i i'm in tahoe i can't watch a warriors game but i can watch the next uh you're doing something pretty creative with making sure all utah residents can see all games for free explain yeah so we have three million people plus in utah and then we're uniquely positioned where we're only you know 45 minutes a half hour from wyoming and you know an hour and a half or an hour from idaho so Mm -hmm. if you actually think about our market you know i've just gone back to ask the question from the world I come from is like, what type of experience are we providing from a viewership standpoint? Mm. And the way the old contract, which was done 10 years ago, we're the first in the league to kind of really come up for renewal. And it it was kind of like, Hey, you sign us over your rights. You don't worry about the experience. You're getting paid. You've got your money. We're going to handle it. We're going to distribute it to the highest bidder. However we do. And I think we had like 15, 50% viewership. Mm. that we were able to access so a million and a half people and then last year a week before the season started dish and this provider kind of were at odds and we lost 20 percent from dish so we were ultimately out of your control providing 30 percent of our audience you know our our games and it, it just didn't feel right so as we walked through um this new kind of paradigm shift in all of local media because it's not just the nba it's it's going to be everyone and everything yeah we couldn't view a scenario where in the future we didn't need to control our own destiny it just it as we strategized out every possible scenario we said hey wait a minute we need to be able to control our own content i mean and this is exactly where bob Iger wound up he's like i don't know who's consuming the Star Wars franchise, the Indiana Jones franchise, the Pixar, I paid all these billions of dollars. I don't even know who's watching it. I don't know at what minute they're turning it off. I don't have their address. I don't even have their email address. Mm-hmm. And then they're criticizing him over Disney Plus. And it's like, do you realize they have hundreds of millions of people's credit cards now? They never had those credit cards. They never had a direct relationship. That's what you're talking about. Essentially. Yeah, so, so, so we, we basically also decided that from an experience standpoint, I remember when I first started working with the NBA at Qualtrics, we were looking at season tickets and we realized that there was like five types of fans for a team. Mm. And we also realized that this old model was assuming there was one fan and yeah. one fan that would consume data one way. So if you just take your like all in pod, like, like how many people are consuming this and how many different varieties and how they want. And so one of the things that we said is like, okay, This is what we're going to do. We are going to control our rights. Hmm. We're basically going to go partner with someone and we're going to, for all intents and purposes, buy airspace on their channel. We're going to give it away for free. Right? So we're going to go into a partnership and then we're going to stand up the sales team and the advertising team and we're going to produce it similar to what you do for your pods. You produce it, you sell the ads, and so you control your destiny. Hmm. And when we did that, it was pretty clear that there was a pretty significant revenue hit, which was the gap. And we were one of the teams, though, and I don't know how many there are, where we had a little bit of a dislocation in the market, where our market size was growing bigger than our previous contract. Hmm. So if we had to back ourselves into, for example, $20 million dollars. Yeah, we could do it Mm. as opposed to someone who legacy contracts were 70 or 80. There's no way they could get there. Yeah. So we said, hey, Utah's the fastest growing state. It has been for like six out of the last 10 years. With this growth, we think we can go and provide an experience to everyone. So the first persona was to go and say anyone on over the air TV can watch it. Second persona. 100% of games. For free. Amazing. Second persona. So, so in one day, we go from about a million people to three million. Mm. Second persona was we're going to sign a deal to go direct to consumer. 
Hmm. And we're going to make it affordable where you can go direct to consumer. You've got to pay. But anytime you go to the utahjazz.com app, you will be able to watch the games. Okay. Oh, in your app? In our app. Wow. One seamless experience. And then the third persona is, okay, what if you're a fan in surrounding states? Mm. And so in, in this situation, we feel like we've gone from three, from one, 1 million people to 3.2 million people, hypothetically, like yeah. whatever it is, plus an online version, which could be another population, let's say a couple hundred thousand, whatever. And now we're saying, hey, well, Idaho, we're kind of the team of Idaho. We're the team of Wyoming. Mm. And we actually spread into Washington and some of these area, their areas. Like, how do we go get another 2 million people? And if we take a step back, we think we found a way to jump market size. Mm. So if you look at, you know, market size, like what's the market size of a team with 5 million people consuming? Yeah, yeah much um, more. Yeah. And, and we're, we're historically branded as a small market team. But there's actually nothing in Salt Lake and Utah that's small market. We have top three tech ecosystem, top four tech ecosystem in the country. Yep. We have 7 million people coming in to recreate, to ski or to do whatever else it is. Yeah. You can jump on a plane 10 minutes from the arena and get to France and London and Amsterdam Major direct. It's huge yep. airport, yeah. And Delta just put $3 billion in there. You yep. have the number one economy. You have the youngest demographic in so there's really not a lot that's small market outside of television household viewerships. Right. Well, and the reason why that's low is because people move out of San Francisco. I think we're the number one exporter out of California, by the way. <laughs> right. And, and they move there to spread out. Yeah. That's what they want to do. They want to leave the super city or the urban area to actually spread out. And so yeah. it's, it's actually a fascinating part of the job. Like the business side of this and working there is like, I want Danny to handle the basketball side. I'm, I'm super involved. I want to be part of it. Um, I believe I can add a lot. But the actual consumption side and how that intertwines with what we do in tech right now is fascinating. Yeah, well, just think, you know, when you start auctioning off chunks of the business, um, then everybody's got a different incentive. And as we know, show me an incentive. I'll show you an outcome. And, you know, you have to, you can now have a 360 degree incentive, merchandise, season tickets, the sponsorship of the arena can now dovetail with the sponsorship of the actual streams, you can collect the emails in the emails can be the upsell for the local car dealership that is now part of the whole process. So just thinking about marketers and advertisers who want to be involved or fans who want to be involved, you're going to have their email, they sign up for the app, you get their email. Now you can send them a last minute notice. Hey, we got some tickets available last minute, same day sales, whatever. This is why when I was looking at Disney, I don't know, 10 years ago, I was like, I think they're going to catch up to Netflix because, and the, the NBA is just starting to do this in the NBA app. They're just starting to upsell you on merchandise. Mm -hmm. The end of the game, you know, if I don't know, RJ Barrett has his best game, you know, he scores 50 points. They should say, Hey, congratulations, RJ Barrett. Here's all the RJ Barrett jerseys at the end of the game. 20% off, you know, buy one, whatever it is. And when I watched Star Wars, the first thing my kids wanted to do when they saw the Mandalorian was get a Grogu. They didn't upsell me that on Disney Plus. They have my address. They have my credit card. At the end of the episode, she said, would you like to buy Grogu? Click here. We'll deliver it to this address. Do you know how many Grogu's I would have sold instead of buying a Grogu off Etsy? That's like handcrafted. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like consumers are going to find it. It's, uh, Yeah. Wow. No, we're, so we're a media company, man. Exactly. You, you're a media company. We're a media company. We have yeah. content. We have distribution. We have talent. Like this is, this is, yeah. this is what it is. And I think that you, you start to understand. And not only that, our players are now their own brands. Big time. Right. They have their own media. Like, and so that's an interesting dynamic here is like, okay, you know, the bigger we make our brand and our umbrella, the yeah. more we can help them where, you know, I don't think it's great to be in a situation where they necessarily believe that their brand is way bigger than the team because then we can't help them. Right. We want to help them. We can get their stories out there and, and help them. And that's, there's nothing wrong or illegal about that. Yeah, no, it's great. I mean, Draymond has, I've had many conversations with Draymond before he started his pod, during his pod, we talk podcast like yeah. every couple yep. of weeks at the poker game. It's beautiful when we hang thing. Out. And I mean, talk about a game changer and people don't know this. 
Mark Cuban was an investor in my blogging company, and we set up Blog Maverick for him. He famously wrote the post about Steve Nash getting traded and why he didn't give him like an extended contract or whatever. That freaked ESPN out. They were like, they wouldn't even link to Cuban's blog. Uh, mm -hmm. And now like folks don't want to link to Draymond's podcast, but it's like Draymond's talking about the game in a very real, like tangible way after a playoff game in his hotel. Yeah. Like, it's incredible. I thought we were going to see this last year. I thought we were going to see the, um, the in playoff game when he got kicked out of the game. I thought we were going to get the in playoff <laughs> game pod. Oh, here it is. Look at this. 2000. I set this. Uh, my partner, Brian uh, yeah. Alvey, shout out to Brian. He came up with the name Blog Maverick. Oh, uh, yeah. And then this is the cool. post he wrote. And Mark emailed me the post. He wrote it on his Blackberry or Sidekick. And he emails it to me. Hey, post this. And I get it in my thing. And I'm like, Mark, the comma is like you're putting a space, then a comma. Like it's always comma, then space. And he's like, leave the typos in. I'm like, but you're using like an ellipsis wrong here. He's like, I want people to know it's me. I'm, I just, I wrote it like stream of conscious. I read it once, just post it. And I'm like, are you sure? He's like, I'm sure go. <laughs> and this like broke the NBA when he wrote this. Do you remember this? Yeah, he, I remember uh, it. It's crazy. I was young. Yeah. It was just like, go direct. I mean, that is the overall like concept of media is consumers want you to go direct. They want to talk to you. You see, you mentioned five personas. I know corporates won. I know the diehard fans who've had season tickets for in their family for like 20, 30 years. That's the other. I know there's like the tourists who come in and they just want to catch a game. They're casual. That's three. Then I got to think there's groups that come to the arena who are like, uh, you know, like a school or something like that. And then I guess there's the people who you don't have who just casually maybe get dragged to a game. Did I get all five? Yeah, pretty close, actually. I mean, I think we we segment a little bit around um, if you overlay the games, right? So like ah. families. Mm -hmm. So like I would argue that in, in Utah, you've got Monday night, which is kind of a family night and then the weekends. And so oh, if you took your weekend dates. games and the families and dates and you said, okay, then you have the business folks, which are typically Monday through Friday. Yeah. And then you would have um, kind of the big game goers like in LA, this would be like the stars are out. Like mm. this would always be the 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 marquee matchup, mm. the marquee game, and then if you overlay that with another variable or or vector, which would be like, where do they want to sit? Uh. So if you look at like big game marquee matchup, you know that those floor seats are going to be high premium, mm. right? Or yep. you've got the diehards or 20, they'll sit wherever and they just want to go and they go to every game. And this is the way it is. You've got families who are typically going on the weekends, mm. right? Because that's when they can, I mean, those school nights, this and that. And then you've got, yeah. you know, events or people that are coming in or big groups or large groups or everything else. So, I mean, you know, they're pretty good. And so yeah. I think historically what you've done is you said, oh, we've got a $3 million marketing budget. We're just going to attack that group. And it's like, mm. wait, that's not one group. No. So actually divide up your budget and go figure out how to creatively tack all of them and you will end up a lot further. What are the what are the courtside seats go for there? You guys at three, four thousand as ticket? Courtside? Uh, we're a little less than that. I think we're really? we're we're probably bottom mid to bottom half of the league. But oh, we okay. do have a four hundred person waiting list to sit courtside. We sold out oh, two hundred and fifty wow. straight games. So That's um, amazing. We're working say, we're like, working on that. I, I have a theory. Uh now. That sitting courtside for playoff nationally, any nationally televised game, because now yeah, I, I got a lot of friends, they have courtside seats, yada, yada, I'm very lucky to have a bunch of friends like that. And, uh, you know, I sit courtside once in a while. Um, and I've sat courtside on some like very high profile games. It is a marketing expense for anybody who's a business or an entertainer. And I have like a little bit of an entertainer thing going on with the podcast. For me to spend literally, I, I, I very rarely buy tickets, but I've spent 10 grand on a ticket, uh, whatever. When I spend that, it is so marketing accretive as an investor in companies or as having a podcast because hundreds of people text me, oh, I see you at the game, I see you at the game. And that's why I think some people do it. I think some people have realized showing up a game and sitting courtside is a marketing expense that makes you seem baller or just build your own brand in the NBA. Uh, and so- I like, mean, what, what goes on or what historically has gone on in Hollywood is not by accident. Yeah. Every talent agent's trying to get their person up front yep. in Hollywood. Yeah. Like for a reason. Yeah. 
Um, the Lakers but games, it's, yeah. it's a cool it's a cool experience. You'll have to come out. I, I, I can find some courtside for you. Coming out. All right. If you are listening to this podcast, you care about innovation, obviously. And one sector that really needed a shakeup was design. I'm always on and on and on about the beautiful design about apps we've invested in, but it's hard to do. In the past, you either had to hire this expensive old school agency, boom, all your startup funding burned. And uh, then there were freelance marketplaces. It can get messy. Let's just leave it at that. There's got to be a better way, right? Well, let me tell you about that better way. It's called Super Side, Super S-I-D-E. It's a new way to get great design done quickly and consistently and at a high level. They call it CAS, Creative as a Service. And I want you to remember CAS. It's a fully managed end-to-end -end service and it's completely hassle-free. What you basically do is you subscribe to SuperSide and then you get an amazing dedicated design team that's built out specifically for you. Brands like Amazon, Meta, Salesforce, and Shopify use SuperSide as well as a bunch of fast-growing startups like mine. And SuperSide only hires the top 1% of designers from around the world. Maybe you wanna do a landing page. Maybe you got ads you're putting up. Maybe you wanna do motion design or custom illustrations. You get a range of skills and that's all uh, done in SuperSide, super fast, super consistent and at a very high level. It is the best way for you to solve this problem and SuperSide has an exclusive offer for Twist listeners. Save 2000 a month with SuperSide's startup accelerator package at superside.com slash twist. That's superside.com slash twist for two grand off. So let's go to Qualtrics. Um, uh, you know, I think people understand the business, uh, getting survey data, leveraging that, um, doing analysis, but a lot has changed since you started the business, specifically, you know, AI, and then there's all the corporate side and the transactions. Let's start with the product. How has the product changed and, and evolved? You, uh, we know there's been transactions you got bought, you IPO'd, and then you just went private. So that's a crazy series of events. Uh, so actually, you take it wherever you want. You want to talk about the transaction side or the business side? Yeah, let's just talk about the product first. I mean, when, yeah. we, when we started up, we started as a, you know, we started in my parents' basement. We started as a general survey platform. We were we were head to head with with our friend Dave Goldberg forever. Rest he tried to piece. buy our yeah. company. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, um, we... You know, we'd, we'd work on just trying to gather data and run analytics on it. And that was kind of, I mean, to be honest with you, it was about all the market could handle. Hmm. You know, we were trying to convince organizations that you need a platform to be able to, you know, gather data you don't have hmm. and be able to turn it around. And 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 then that evolved. Like, we, we went really into data management. Like, okay, how are we going to take, like, you have all these systems that are collecting what we call your operational data, which is what happened. It'll tell you your finance numbers. It'll tell you your shipping numbers. It'll tell you this. But you don't have any systems in place to really manage the hearts, the minds, the sentiment, the feeling. And... If you go into an organization, you say, well, where, where is that data? How is it run? You see like just an array of products and groups and, and a lot of money being spent. But reality is, is most of that data was one and done. It was never used again. It was never mm. set up. And so specifically when it came around customer experience and the employee experience, they were run on multiple platforms, but we found that they had a lot of similarities between them. So we went through this crazy five-year exercise of saying, hey, we've got the world's number one survey platform. We've got a chance to actually build out what we call an experience platform where we're managing the four core experience of your businesses all together. And, you know, we've been able to do that. So we'll walk mm -hmm. into an organization and we'll say, hey, you've got your operational data systems. You're spending billions of dollars trying to get them to talk to each other. But you've got this whole other line of data that's coming into your organization that actually helps you run it from the outside in and really get at what people are thinking and where they're going to go next. This data you're trying to predict where they're going to go next, they'll tell you. So, mm. like, let's just actually, <laughs> like, take this data and let's present it organizationally. So, all the data, first of all, is captured into one single system. So, then it could be used again. And we're storing this on our, our experience management platform where all that data lives. And we're actually building profiles around um, individuals and like what has happened, how they've responded. And you're actually able to see and almost have a dialogue and communicate with your end user, whether that's your employee, whether that's your customer. And um, 
it's actually become more and more important over time. Yeah. So it's not like we created something that was a fad. Actually, when we started the business, it like wasn't cool. And then like, as we've aged, it's become actually more and more critical for the way organizations run. And if you so, think about it, when you, when you think about what you did, everybody kind of looks at like, uh, there's, when you said the, the market wasn't really ready for the product is sort of what I read into that. Like, yeah. People would be like, oh, tell me about my customers. Okay, do a focus group. Okay, let me just like stick my finger in the water, put my finger in the air. Okay, the wind's blowing this way. As opposed to saying every day, um, we are collecting information about these people and we're communicating or interacting with them based on that data. So it's like, it's sort of a whole paradigm shift of just taking the temperature of the water or just always knowing. You just always know what the temperature is of the customer. Yeah, it's not It's not product. an event. The best companies yes. who do this, it's not an event. Like if you look at like Delta Airlines, who just launched free Wi-Fi, like we're sitting there hooked up with Ed and the management team mm -hmm. with a command center like this room with everything that's going on as they go free Wi-Fi on every one of their planes with the data that they're giving and feedback. And it's just, are you good? Are you good? Yeah. How are you feeling? Oh, wait, we also have their sky miles number. So we know the profile of Jason yep. and like we can see who you are. And then we start running our machines in the background to say, and, and all of our prompts like, okay, do we have a problem with this travel group or this travel group or this travel group? And then we're like, wait a minute, we just removed a massive hurdle or obstacle on the flight. And one thing we didn't realize is that flight attendants and the people working for the airline on the flight are seeing a 23% increase in their satisfaction on the flight. Holy mm. cow, this impacted this. Ah. Like, keep going. And so, so this is actually the opportunity that every organization has is like, quit trying to run your business entirely from what you and your organization think. Mm. Like, we used to not be able to gather this data. We used to not be able to go get it. When I started, we couldn't do it. Hmm. Now we have the ability to start to, to basically, we always say you can Qualtrics everything. Yeah. And like, if you, if you, if you have the data that exists, you can Google it. If you don't, you can Qualtrics it and like get it out there and start to build this flow. So it's not an event. It's actually another input on how you run your business. Yeah. Just that, that one example is so mind blowing because. You, you might have some people sitting there, hey, this is a business traveler. Wait a second, this is a business traveler with three kids with them now. Uh, oh, and they're business traveling, they're in business class. Oh, they're in economy plus right now. Oh my God, the guy's got 500,000 miles sitting there. We need to upsell them on some stuff. Uh, and just even knowing that, like, whoa, where are they going on vacation? And then now you've got some data from them being online. Man, it's just killer. Well, what if they you, if you look out. at their business, it's a commodity business. Every single airline buys the exact same Planes. Plane. <laughs> yeah. They have the same airport that they don't control. They don't yep. control TSA. How is one airline a top 12 respected brand in the world? Yeah. And the others can't figure it out when they all have the weather, they all have this, they all have that. And it's because experience is the moat. Mm. Yeah. When it's a race to the bottom, experience, which I believe all most tech businesses are. Yep. It becomes a race to the bottom. It's a heavyweight fight and you just kind of keep pounding. Your experience moat is the competitive advantage. I and mean, that's the problem we're tackling. You look at something like the Bloomberg terminal. Like that is a should be a commodity business, but the experience then as you're saying, it just experience builds brand, right? Uh, 100%. And, like if you're staying at an Amman hotel, if anybody's ever been to one of those AMAN, I got to stay in one in Tokyo. Like, all of a sudden, you're like, whoa, this is totally different. Like, I have a place to stay when I'm in Tokyo. There's a million places for me to stay. But this one has done something completely different than put a roof over my head and four walls and clean sheets. It's uh, kind of crazy. Let's go to the AI side. Are you totally down the AI rabbit hole now? I would think, given the fact that you have all this data, and data scientists are like... I don't, uh, the most amazing demos I've seen of AI right now are, here's a CSV file. What yeah. question should I ask? And ChatGPT's like, oh, well, here's what's in it. These are the questions I would ask. And you're like, well, what trends do you see in the data? And it's like, here's 20 trends. And you're like, well, these 10 are totally irrelevant. These five are obvious. Oh, these five, I didn't even think of. 
I mean, it, it's got to be inspiring for you on a product level, huh? Yeah, if you think about how much unstructured data we are holding, I think we're one of the largest companies in the world that hold unstructured data. And this is feedback that people are giving, um, whether it's in call center or this or that. Um, you know, this data, th this AI, it's interesting as I watched the AI revolution said, okay, why now? Why now is this happening? Because it's almost like mm -hmm. a light switch went on. It's so and, weird. We're talking about six months, right? This all started yeah. in the fall. We're not even and, on a year. And it's interesting because as we've been in talks with some of these hyperscalers, whether it's Google or Amazon, whatever, you know, they've had this technology for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. They've been working on it. And the, the, the analogy I use is, you know, I go back to like when Salesforce or Microsoft or other, other organizations like were a closed system. And then they said, wait, we're going to create an ecosystem. We're going to mm -hmm. allow vendors to build apps on top of it. And it was just like a switch that flipped. And yep. what they did is they said, hey, we've got all this technology. Nothing's changed. However, we're actually going to give you a front door to it. Mm. And Google never had a real good front door until they were forced to or decided, hey, we don't need to be perfect here. Everyone else is doing it. It gives us air cover. We're going to flip. Here's the front door. Here's the open API system that yep. you can go in and, and, you know, modularize or you can build, you know, different applications on top of that. And this is when, like, I know in the business to business space or in the enterprise space, when that became the norm, innovation around business applications took off. And yep. so... We're just seeing this scenario where OpenAI kind of let out and everyone else has opened up a front door and built some steps and to be able to access what they only had internally. And that's where we're going to see every new startup going, wait, I can grab this and my idea. I've got a business pain. I, I, I mean, I'll give you a great example. I just saw someone tweeted at me and said, hey, I've got a... The, the new collective bargaining agreement came out. It's a PDF that's like 578 pages and the teams who learn them the best know and fans historically have no idea what the real rules are. It's all in the yep. CBA. And someone built like a GPT on top of that. Wow. And it was like, you could just ask any questions. And it was just like that quick mm. because they had a front door to be able to go do that and yep. take that equivalent. And so when it comes to our business, I mean, we just held an AI summit. I think there were 60 demos and it's like, Whoa, like we could take a data set within our own environment and say, similar to the CSV, let's query this, put a table in. Um, what questions should I ask? Like we we could actually, there, there's a lot that people can do. Um, there's still a little bit of work to get corporations to feel comfortable on what's going on. Their data is not being shared mm. and, and that's privacy and security. But quick things that I see, I see someone like Microsoft. Yep who's got LinkedIn, who has a CRM product, who's got Word and PowerPoint. If you're a seller working for an enterprise organization and you're trying to create a proposal for Jason and you don't know Jason very well, or you're trying to target a company, you can now go and say, hey, give me an org chart of this organization, create a PowerPoint, scrub our CRM, and I want this pricing and this and that. And all of a sudden you're sitting there going, holy cow. Yep. First of all, this person did a better job. Go tweak it. And it'll probably fundamentally change, first of all, who we go with mm. as yeah. an enterprise stack. Yeah. Because of this problem that every organization has when they're managing huge sales teams. And, and it will also change the productivity of, of all of this. And so. Are you seeing those productivity gains internally already? Or do you got people yeah, using it every day? I think we're early days. I think we're early yeah. days. I think we're super early days. And I think, I think that the fact that all of wall street's like, I'm going to have this company stand up and I need to see your AI strategy or we're going to downgrade your stock. And it's like, what do you, you don't even know what you're talking about. Like, yeah. like a flashy demo is like a, a rendering of a real estate project that, has no chance of passing, right? Yeah. Like, like we, we, you, you actually need to see, like, this is not probably the first mover advantage I see. I think it's mm. more of who can actually build a moat. 
mm-hmm. around what they're doing to be able to last the the time that it's going to require. You worry about uh, job displacement at all? Uh, if you look at some of the tasks being done here, uh, the da- everybody's we're short data scientists everywhere. Every organization you work with is like, oh, do you have any data scientists to help us Qualtrics this whatever? Uh, and then it feels like everybody's going to be able to have like, I don't know, a two year degree in data science abstracted and just put into their toolkit, just like everybody now can type and do basic graphics and graphic design. So what do you think about job displacement and AI? I, I don't think I mean, I, I worry about job dipl- displacement, but I worry about the other macro environments causing more job displacement than AI. Hmm example and yeah. there's been a lot of buzz around ai causing job displacement and less about what's going on in washington and our causes and everything else is having much more of an impact in the broader job mm-hmm. tech world um because i think with displacement i see change change in the way we work yeah and if you're thinking that no one's going to want to scale the the way people do scale is no matter who who says it like there's not many hundred person companies that go create, you know, multi hundreds of billions of dollars. Like they scale through people. Yeah. And so still when, they, people. Yeah. when they nail it, they're going to want to scale whatever it is they nail up. And so um, when it comes to overall job displacement, it's, it's much more around, you know, how, how kind of frothy the last 10 year run has been and um, people often getting surprised. Did, did you guys, uh, do a riff and get too big during that sort of zerp environment yourselves and have to I mean, like I resize? I, yeah, I don't think any, I don't, it's not that everyone got too big. There was just a cadence of which everyone has hired uh, for the future. Right. We were hired. I mean, the, the job market's been so competitive that you had to hire out 18 to 24 months in order to even somewhat hit the possible gl- growth plans. Mm. And so I think I think the lead time has shrunken. I mean, you look at we hired seventeen hundred people in the in the middle of the pandemic. In like, why? Because our models were saying, "Hey, look, the way we used to do this is we're going to compound in a way, and you've got this amount of attrition, and this is going to happen. This is how it's going to go, and we can't let off the gas, or we're not going to be able to scale." And that market has reset entirely on all of those dimensions. Mm. And so I think that people are now adjusting to that market because I don't think it's like, Hey, we're not going to hire at all. Or we're, we're going to let everyone off and stop. No, it's like, okay, the pace, the market, who you hire, who you can get mm. um, is different than it was pre pandemic and post pandemic. And so um, the same way that we all had to ramp up, our our costs our equity everything in 2017 18 19 whether we liked it or not we were in a game we were in a market yeah, no, you had to play the game on the field right i mean if you you're had to play up the against game on google the field. and microsoft uh, and uber 100%. and airbnb giving huge option grants you don't really have a choice yeah, yeah. and so what's the game on the field right now yeah and i think uh, this is the earnings. part that people yeah, yeah earnings, <laughs> Profitability. Right? like like the game on the field and so i think that if i'm someone working in a corporation and understanding it, you, you've got to understand the game and the temperature of what's happening on the field. Yeah. And as, as a junior employee, if I'm a first job, like you're working, if you're working in tech, which is most people listening to this, you work in tech, understand tech, right? Like you, you it's your responsibility. You just don't work for the company. Like you need to understand the landscape in the field. Cause the more you understand tech, the more it's going to help you whenever job you're doing. Yeah. And the customers now are also doing belt tightening, looking at every expense, negotiating contracts. They're not as freewheeling where they're just like, yeah, oh, this SaaS product could make us 2% more efficient and uh, it costs, you know, 1%. Great. That's a great investment. Let's just buy it, buy everything. Uh, now everybody's looking at every single bill. They're negotiating them. They're negotiating their cloud bill. They're negotiating their SaaS bills. They're negotiating their rent. Everybody is just in austerity mode. So it's harder to sell, right? Yeah. I mean, Look, if you if you follow the Qualtrics journey, we've got 20 years, right, where we have operated um, a bunch of different ways. Mm. And we've seen the reaction of every market across that 
across that uh, across that time period. So the first ten years were 100 percent bootstrapped. We were in Utah. Yep. You know, it was me, my in dad, and my brother in the yeah. basement, and no one wanted to raise venture capital because everyone had been burned in '99 and all of that. This was 2002. It was like I think Austin Atlassian, who were yep. the longest bootstrap companies. We raised money in 2011 and shifted yep. our model. Um, I remember operating in 2007, 8, and 9 yep. and trying to go to market. And every marketing team we had, everyone we would sell into um, could not, like, not only purchase, a lot of them didn't have jobs. Mm. And so that was... I would say an extreme to what we're dealing with now, but even in that extreme, we had to completely change our offering, our messaging and our value proposition for that time. Mm. 2011, we raised, you know, what would be between 2012 and 2018, about $400 million of, um, you know, venture capital from Excel, Sequoia, Insight, and none of that went into the company. So that was all secondary outside of the business. Yeah. So essentially, we went from 2002 to 2018 without putting any money on the books. Just pure profits, yeah. Invested pure in the pure business. Profits. And so one was a profitable model where we just tried to like make it for the first 10 years. The second was we were going to fly the plane really close to the trees. Mm. So we weren't going to lose money, but we were going to break even every year, whatever that was, and invest everything back in growth. We're three days before going public. We're on the road show. We're 15 times oversubscribed. The market's in the toilet of October, November of 19. We're the only company on the road. We look great because we had the ability to show high growth and profits. Bill McDermott, who was CEO of SAP, calls and says, hey, Ryan, do you want to be a public CEO? I say, the answer is, well, no. I would never really wanted to, but this mm -hmm. is the next phase. And it's kind of what you're signing up for yeah. <laughs> when you take on that much venture capital. You, yeah, for sure. Th yeah. That's in the cards. And so do you want to be a public CEO? He said, well, let's go public a different way. Hmm. We love the experience category. We want the experience category. I will put at the tip of our spear at SAP and I will take you global. Hmm. We're the largest software company in Europe. So we sign up for that year and a half later. Bill takes a job at ServiceNow. John Donahoe goes to Nike. And he had, he had basically purchased us in an all-cash deal, but Qualtrics was too important to the category we were creating as well as Utah. And we said, hey, we want to keep rolling. And, you know, SAP during this time, pandemic, says, hey, let's go focus on our core where we're, where our strength is, which is ERP and some of these other areas. And we're this growth engine that needs to be fed. And so we said, well, why don't we go public? Well, can we? Have we? Yep. Can you do this? Yep. And I called Egon Durbin at Silver Lake, who had just taken VMware Dell, pulled that one out, and we decided we were going public. Um, and then a year and a half later, um, they had a 70% stake, and we needed to figure out a way to go down. And we ran um, kind of an auction in and, and Silver Lake ends up winning and uh, we went private a week and a half ago. Wow. And so now we're pre-IPO again, <laughs> <laughs> which and is so, my favorite time running the company. And so- Well, uh, when, you're, when you're private, you get to think not in quarters, you start thinking in years. I mean, you it, might it, still have quarterly goals, you still have weekly goals, but you, you have a different approach to the business, yeah? Yeah, and, and, and reality is, is like, if you look at that 20 year run between 2016, when you're getting ready to go public to being public, you don't have a lot of time to take the plane down, stop it, refuel, mm. rearrange some seats. Yep. Some folks that were on that part of the journey. You, you don't have the, the energy or the time or the ability. And right. one of those was when we took the plane back up, I wasn't CEO. Mm. I wanted to be executive chairman. My mm. number two, Zig Serafin, who I had recruited out of Microsoft, we'd operated two in a box. Mm. He ran Skype for business and Link and helped build Cortana. And he was going to be the CEO somewhere. Yeah. I would have rather had him be the CEO with us. Mm. And so he took it through the IPO and now he's the CEO and I'm chairman of Nuco. Mm. 
which is a brand new company. And I've sat in front of the whole company and say, hey, look, Ziggs, Ziggs is the new founder. Yeah. I'm the old founder. Yep. This is a new start. <laughs> if you're not signed up for that, right. then you probably shouldn't be here. Right. <laughs> right? Uh, this is what we're signing up for. And by the way, I'm going to invest in Zig because if Zig was starting yeah. a new company, I'd be his first check. Mm. And so this is the phase of this as opposed to this revisionist history that's like, Hey, what's going on in 2007? It's not the same. It's not the same as 2015. Nothing's the same in the world. Like no. we need to go forward. And Silver Lake is the biggest check that they've written. Yeah, it's the it's most the commitment they've history. had. Yeah, and you know, if you look at what they've done with Dell, VMware, what they've done with WME and UFC and Endeavor and yeah. WWE or Fanatics or you know even Twitter, like yep. there's a lot that they seem to not lose very much right now yeah uh i mean operating a company uh privately you get to really start to think long term and like you're saying you can reset the culture and uh you know as long as everybody buys into it it's kind of like that good to great book jim collins wrote i don't know if you ever read that one but yeah for sure back when there were only like you know 100 business books that was one of the ones that always the 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 lesson there like before you decide your destination like get the right people on the bus and get the wrong people off the bus and then you guys are driving uh, in the right direction. Listen, uh, I took an hour of your time. Another great episode. Uh, can't wait to come out. I'll look at the schedule when it comes out. And uh, whenever those Knicks games are, I'll come out. You, you've Hopefully got, it's during ski seats, season. You've got seats right next to me oh, during the Knicks game. I love it. And, uh, I, love I don't it. think I don't think we'll have you do layup lines, but if that's part of it, maybe you and I could do. It. We could play a may, little horse. <laughs> maybe you could. Maybe you could warm up with. Maybe the Knicks will let you warm up being such a diehard fan with them. Absolutely, I'll I will wear my. Uh, <laughs> I, I will. Uh, I will wear my Jalen Brunson uh, jersey. What a great acquisition that was, huh? He's a stud. He's a stud. Uh, like I he mean, killed us. He killed us in Dallas. Like Luca was out, and he killed us. I mean, he is. Like so blue collar, hardworking. He had like the lowest turnover percentage, and like his, his stats were so all star. He didn't make the all star team. It was very weird. Um, and then every everybody's like, "Oh my god, you overpaid twenty three million dollars for Jalen Brunson." I'm like, "Really? Like we're talking about trading for some people making forty million a year who are not exactly putting up the same numbers as Jalen Brunson?" As a these max contracts are crazy, huh? This new uh, they're they're it's it's going to escalate quickly. Like the Jalen Brown deal, which is like three hundred plus. Like you start looking at this, or or even Dame, or what what Dame or Steph, and yeah. I mean, it's part of it. But there's a lot of these guys who who do a lot. Like I mean, there's an argument yeah. that some of these some of these dudes are worth a lot more than that. Right? Well, like, if you look at the increase in the Warriors when they bought it, it was that like a. 600 million i think they bought it for something crazy and then it became a three billion dollar team i think when chamath sold his shares to private equity uh i mean that was one of the big ramp ups of all time uh and this yeah, new, they've done a great job this new uh television deal when is that that's happening for next uh, season 24 24 yeah so that's uh, deep negotiation yeah yeah talks will start here soon and that'll that'll be interesting it'll be an interesting metric to see how new TV, new entrants come in. Um, it'll it'll be really interesting to see what what happens because this is a big moment for not only the NBA but for a lot of these fledging media companies that are out there. I mean, distribution, yeah. whether it's Apple, you, you know, I'm I'm part of MLS with Real Salt Lake, and you know, Apple and Messi and what's happened. It's it's pretty interesting. Pretty yeah, interesting. I mean it. It does seem like Apple and Google and Amazon, there's just a whole new entrance of player who are playing the game at a different level. You know, if you've got, I, I, people didn't realize this, but Apple slowly has become the majority uh, operating system here in the US. Everybody think, still thinks iOS is like, oh yeah, that's a 20 or 30%. That's just rich people. It's like, have you been paying attention? <laughs> like their market share is now the majority uh, iOS and they've just run the table. It's such a great product, such a great base of users. All right, listen, uh, can't wait to see you. Uh, have Tempo. a great off season. Good luck with everything. And congrats on uh, going private and the team. And uh, stay safe. And we'll see you uh, for the 23-24 season for the Knicks All games. Right. Can't wait, brother. <laughs> Let's go, man. All right, I appreciate cheers. it.